In the forest wilderness, where the echo of footsteps echoes far around, and every rustle seems a sign of alarm, a dramatic scene took place. At the center of this tense moment was a young girl who suddenly became the focus of a pack of wolves. These predators, known for their ferocity and cunning, surrounded her, preparing to attack. Their eyes, blazing with the red fire of greed and hunger, were fixed irresistibly on the girl, who seemed to be in a desperate situation, enveloped in a cloud of swirling dust raised by their furious whirling. The tension in the air reached a climax as the wolves finally decided to make a decisive leap, aiming to bring their prey down to the ground and tear it apart. However, the outcome of this fight was completely unexpected. In the blink of an eye, the dynamics of the scene changed so dramatically that it seemed as if time had slowed down. Just seconds after the wolves attacked, they were defeated, and of the entire pack, once threatening and powerful, only one was left alive. This turning point demonstrates not only the unexpectedness of fate, but also the girl's indestructible spirit, the epitome of bravery and mastery of weapons. With an unwavering determination and agility worthy of the best warriors, the girl raised her sword, an instrument that had become an extension of her will and strength. With a final swing, she finished off the remaining wolf, ending a threat that moments ago seemed inevitable. This act of not just defending, but asserting herself in such a brutal confrontation became a symbol of her indomitability and courage. So, in the bosom of the forest, amidst the remnants of the battle and the rising dust, the girl was left standing alone. Her figure, framed by the light filtering through the trees, and her gaze filled with both sadness for her fallen foes and relief at her victory, were the final chord in this epic story of survival and heroism. The moment the world of the game became insufficiently exciting to her, she, with deep reflection assessing the situation, came to the conclusion that the tasks related to the wolves near the beginner's village did not pose any difficulty for her. There was still time before the next boss appeared, and it gave her a moment's distraction from the usual rhythm of adventure. With that thought, she easily removed her ring from her finger, the key to returning to reality, and suddenly, as if by magic, found herself back in her own room, surrounded by pink hues that filled the space with tenderness and comfort. The room, as if brought to life from a fairy tale, enveloped her in soft light and warmth, making her forget for a moment all the adventures in the virtual world. She paid particular attention to the subtle, barely perceptible scent that hung softly in the air, filling the space with sweetness and warmth. The smell, so familiar yet magical, reminded her of the carefree days of her childhood when the whole family would gather at home to enjoy the simple pleasures of life. The smell of the freshly baked cookies she loved so much— brought her back to those precious moments when time seemed to stop, and happiness was as simple and accessible as those little sweet treats. Returning to the real world brought her not only the peace and comfort of her own room, but also the opportunity to rest her soul for a moment, remembering the warm moments of life, which seemed to her now so distant and at the same time so dear. The moment the sweet taste of the cookies, baked masterfully by Anessa's hands, dissolved on Alice's tongue, she couldn't contain her admiration and easily recognized that these culinary masterpieces were truly flawless. Each bite of the cookie was like an embodiment of the very essence of flavor and craftsmanship that Annis put into her delights. At that moment, the maid Annis came running into the room, barely able to catch her breath, with excitement and anticipation in her voice, she told Alice the news, that His Majesty wished to visit the gardens that Alice had managed with such care and devotion. However, Alice, the owner of the gardens and the soul of the company at this moment, did not pay much attention to this news. Easily brushing aside the seeming importance of the moment, she displayed her indomitable nature and unwavering interest in matters more serious than royal outings. Her question about whether His Majesty planned to gather all the concubines, or would prefer to meet them one by one, was asked with a note of genuine curiosity and a thirst for knowledge about the upcoming royal decisions. The answer that followed was simple and yet revealing of the veil of royal intentions. His Majesty had decided to meet each concubine individually, one by one, 
thus demonstrating his devotion and respect for each of them individually. Annis, not concealing her surprise and some excitement, turned to Alice to remind her that the event of His Majesty's forthcoming visit to the gardens was a momentous one indeed. After all, the king had not appeared here for two whole years, which gave the moment a special significance and weight. She emphasized that Alice should take this event with a greater degree of enthusiasm and inspiration, because such visits do not happen every day and can carry the beginning of new opportunities. Alice, however, retained her usual casualness and calmness, reacting to Ines's words with surprising indifference. She reminded him that His Majesty's harem included many concubines, as many as forty-eight, of whom only two were given special attention by the king. This remark was made to show that the chances of becoming an object of His Majesty's special interest seemed to her slim. Following this logic, Alice asked Annas a question designed to clarify just how many concubines could boast looks beyond her own beauty. Annas, with considerable difficulty in choosing her words, admitted that there might be about ten of them. This answer only strengthened Alice's conviction that the king's interest in her was very unlikely. With ease and a note of irony, she concluded that, given the given context, His Majesty's visit to the gardens where she labored was of little importance to her. Alice reasoned that if she wasn't one of the chosen ones to win the king's attention with her beauty and charm, there was no reason to worry about his rare visit. In an atmosphere filled with the subtle flavor of intrigue and palace secrets, the conversation between Alice and Annez took a new turn. Alice, with a slight smile on her lips but a serious undertone in her voice, expressed her displeasure at Annez's constant attempts to convince her that being a good concubine to the emperor was her destiny. Annez, without getting lost, went straight to another argument, mentioning that the Empress often addressed letters to her, which unwittingly emphasized the connection and influence that the Empress had on the lives of concubines. Alice, never missing an opportunity to spice up the dialogue, ironically wondered when Schnarl, the Empress, had gotten closer to Annis than she was to herself, as if to point out that the connections within the palace were sometimes more complicated and intricate than they appeared at first glance. Annes, without backing down, clarified that the letters from the Empress contained hints about Alice's expectation of having an heir, which was not only a wish, but part of her duties as a concubine. This revelation took Alice by surprise, for the pending birth of an heir by a concubine was not just a personal matter, but a matter of national importance, reflecting the political and dynastic ambitions of the empire. She couldn't believe that her sister actually expected Alice to get pregnant by Emperor Bahamut IV and seemed very enthusiastic. Annes was very pleased with Alice's reaction, expecting her to finally realize the importance of her role as a concubine. However, Alice's reaction to these words was unexpected and decisive. She declared, with determination and a note of defiance in her voice, that such an event as her pregnancy with the emperor was not meant to happen. This moment opened Annes's eyes to the complexity of Alice's situation. The realization that Alice was to enter into such an intimate relationship with the Emperor without even being able to see his face added weight to her decision to remain aloof from the palace intrigues and dangers of being a concubine. Annes, though she tried to convince Alice of the importance of fulfilling her duties, could not ignore the cruel realities of palace life that Alice had so vividly described. The story of a concubine being punished with a whip for getting close to the emperor, and the emperor's own indifference to the occasion, only underscored Alice's determination to stay away from these kinds of high honors. Alice, showing determination and discernment, decided that the safety and tranquility of her own room was preferable to any privileges that life as a concubine at court might offer. This choice not only highlighted Alice as a character with a deep understanding of her desires and boundaries, but also as a person capable of standing up for her beliefs in the face of societal and political pressure. For Annes, it was a moment of realization that there were deep and dark shadows even within the golden cages of palace existence, and that her ward's happiness and safety were above any ambitions and expectations that might be imposed upon them from the outside. Annes, Alice's maid, but also her confidant, expressed doubts about her mistress's ability to escape the public eye for the rest of her life. Alice, however, saw her situation differently. 
She was a hostage, it was true, but her role in this political balance between countries was something she regarded without a shadow of sadness or regret. This role ensured peace between her homeland and the empire, and Alice saw it as her purpose. Aness, however, had not given up hope of seeing Alice in a more significant role within the empire, perhaps even at its very top as empress. This suggestion sparked an argument between them, during which they exchanged views on whether Alice should pursue such a role. The argument gathered momentum until Alice, in a moment of sincerity and determination, expressed her categorical unwillingness to tie her fate to a man for whom she felt no love, even for the sake of power. In an atmosphere filled with the tension of the previous discussion, Anes suddenly felt a wave of embarrassment coloring her face with shades of shyness. Her reaction was caused by Alice's straightforward statement, who seemed to see no limits to her desires and expressions. In response to the charge of directness, Alice, with the ease that was peculiar to her, announced her intention of having a lover. This statement sent a flurry of emotions through Anes, ranging from outrage to deep despair as the last drop of understanding fell on her consciousness, revealing the true meaning of Alice's words. Despair pierced Inez as she realized that Alice was not talking about the real world, but about the world of virtual reality, where the possibilities seemed limitless and the consequences less so. This realization was a blow to Inez, for she had interpreted Alice's words too literally, not expecting such a turn. When Alice confirmed her intentions in the context of the virtual world, Anise's emotional outburst reached a climax. Stunned and confused, she had no choice but to leave the room, fighting the tears that began to drop restlessly down her cheeks. Before disappearing from sight, Anne's, through her tears, dropped the words that she intended to tell the Empress. It was not so much a threat as a momentary reaction to her overwhelming feelings. There was a note of betrayal and disappointment in her voice, as the world she had been willing to follow Alice into was suddenly not what she had expected. Stretched out at full length, Alice found a moment of peace on the softness of the couch, which seemed like an island of comfort in the storm of her daily life. With a smile full of thoughtfulness and lightness, she concluded that it was necessary to find a way to cheer up Aness, whose heart had been so unexpectedly wounded. In that rush of caring was hidden the depth of their bond, despite all the obstacles and misunderstandings. Then, in a moment of self-reflection, Alice walked over to the mirror where her gaze met her own reflection. She gazed into herself, as if looking for confirmation of her own uniqueness and beauty, which, to her sister, seemed imperfect. But deep in her heart, Alice found satisfaction in her style, in her uniqueness, which made her exactly who she was. Her self-esteem did not require the approval of others, as she drew strength from her own inner world, which was full of colors and shades available only to her alone. Relaxing on the couch, Alice took her magic ring in her hands, an object that was probably connected to many secrets and memories. As she touched it, she thought about the past seven years of her life, marked by her marriage to the emperor. The years flew by, and to her own surprise and relief, she never came face to face with him. This lack of contact was a source of unexpected happiness for Alice, as she was able to maintain her independence and inner freedom without submitting to the heavy burden of royal duties and expectations that so often accompany roles like hers. As soon as the ring on Alice's finger flashed with a soft blue light, it was as if she had crossed an invisible threshold, leaving the physical world beyond. Finding herself in a space where the boundaries of reality were blurring, Alice felt the virtual forest come alive around her. This world, made of digital codes and virtual textures, seemed more real to her, more tangible than the reality she had just left. Here, amidst the rustling of leaves and the soft underlying whispers of nature, she found a refuge for her soul. Standing in the middle of a forest made of millions of pixels, Alice felt the tension and fatigue that had accumulated over the years slowly leave her. Here, in this virtual space, she could be herself, unconstrained by etiquette or social expectations. In this world, where every step forward opened up new horizons and opportunities, Alice found what she lacked in reality, a true sense of happiness and freedom. The freedom the game gave her was nothing more than a doorway to a world where she could control her destiny, choose her paths, and experience adventures unavailable to her in the real world.
This freedom was more than just an escape for Alice. It was an opportunity to experience life in its multiple dimensions, exploring the depths of human experience in an environment where the constraints of the real world had no power. In this virtual forest, she could experience the joy of exploration, a sense of adventure, and most importantly, a sense of fullness of being that so rarely visited her in her everyday life. So, by immersing herself in virtual reality, Alice found not just a refuge from a world full of demands and limitations, but a space where her spirit was free to soar, exploring the limitless expanse of imagination and freedom of choice. As soon as the thought of the boss's appearance flashed through Alice's mind, the virtual forest around her seemed to respond to her challenge. Suddenly, the space was filled with an ominous red light, and a crowd of demonoids advanced from behind the trees like shadows. Their red eyes glittered with lust for battle, and their razor-sharp claws promised a swift and merciless fight. However, for Alice, an experienced and brave warrior in this virtual world, such a battle was nothing more than entertainment, a way to test her skills and abilities. With a dexterity worthy of the best warriors of the virtual world, Alice easily dodged a brutal blow from one of the giant demonoids. Her movements were precise and graceful, like a dance in which every step and turn mattered. The next moment, from under her cloak, she pulled out her sword, a weapon filled with magical power, capable of piercing the hardest armor and destroying darkness. When the mid-level boss, the demonoid chief, appeared before her, towering with his formidable appearance, Alice didn't hesitate for a moment. She shortened the distance between herself and the enemy with a few quick steps. Her sword glinted under the rays of the virtual sun, and with a single blow, she sent the boss into oblivion. The explosive energy from the sword strike exploded around her, disappearing with the last of the demonoids, leaving behind only the emptiness and silence of the forest. This battle was only one of many in her virtual life, but each victory reminded her why she loved this world so much. Alice looked around at the area around her where the battle had just raged. She noticed that her health points were slightly reduced due to a careless sword strike that had accidentally cut down one of the trees. In this virtual world, nature was sacred, and any harm to it was punishable by loss of health. To many, such punishment might have seemed insignificant, but Alice took every game detail seriously. She strove for perfection, and any diminution in her vitality was frowned upon, even if it was the result of minor carelessness. With this dissatisfaction in mind, Alice refocused on the main goal of her adventure in the woods today, a refight with the Lord of the Dire Woods. This boss was the key to her next level of development in the game, and she had already defeated it several times. However, she needed to defeat him five more times to complete the task, and she could only meet the boss once a day. She was confident in her superiority over the other players, who she assumed would hardly dare cross her path in a boss battle. This confidence came not only from her skills and experience in the game, but also from the knowledge that her level was awe-inspiring to less experienced players. However, to her surprise, the expected boss never showed up at the agreed-upon battle site. This made Alice rethink the situation, and she came to the conclusion that the lord of the dire forest she was supposed to fight had chosen a different arena for their clash. With that thought in mind, Alice decided to take advantage of the unique method of travel available to the players of her world. She summoned Pippi, a majestic riding bird that was not only a means of transportation, but also a faithful companion in her adventures. This moment of hugging Pippi was more than just preparation for a run. It was an expression of trust and a deep bond between a character and his pet that the virtual world made tangible. Interestingly, in this world, the mode of transportation depended on the geographical location of the player's real world. Thus, the inhabitants of the southern regions received sled birds, powerful and imposing creatures that could carry their owners over long distances in a flash. This unique aspect added a special charm to the game, allowing players to feel a special connection to their virtual environment. After a brief moment with Pippi, Alice climbed on his back and gave the command in search of the Lord of the Dire Forest. With the ease and grace characteristic of these mighty birds, Pippi took off sharply into the thick of the forest, as fast as if he were flying. 
This moment of fast riding, when the ground rapidly shrinks in size and the wind blows across your face, was the beginning of a new chapter in Alice's adventures, full of danger and unexpected discoveries in pursuit of her adversary through the forests, fields, and mountains of the virtual world. Against the shimmering virtual landscape, Alice, riding her unrivaled companion Pippi, shrouded herself in a cloak, adding mystery to her image. At that moment, she used the mirror spell to look at her own reflection. The magic mirror reflected her image, highlighting the details of her outfit and shading every aspect of her appearance, giving her confidence in her own uniqueness and strength. But the virtual world is always full of surprises. And as Alice seemed to be preparing for the next stage of her journey, Peepy suddenly slowed down. This unexpected action was a harbinger of an important event. The Lord of the Dire Woods had appeared before Alice. This moment tested her readiness for unexpected challenges, because coming face to face with her boss required instant reaction and strategic thinking. However, instead of the expected start of the battle, Alice found herself the spectator of another drama. An unknown player had already engaged the Overlord in battle. This discovery caused her to call Pippi away, in an attempt to make sense of the situation. Alice's surprise was twofold. First, she couldn't understand why the boss didn't attack her immediately. Second, the appearance of an unknown player introduced a new element to an already confusing situation. This unexpected turn of events added tension to the atmosphere, making each successive moment filled with anticipation and intrigue. She knew that the rules of this world hid the names and intentions of the other players behind a shroud of secrecy until a direct confrontation occurred or until they self-disclosed. Standing on the threshold of a potential confrontation, Alice concluded, based on the course of the battle and the behavior of the unknown player, that she was facing a newcomer. Her intuition told her that his inexperienced actions would soon lead to the inevitable outcome, his defeat at the hands of the Lord of the Dire Forest. In this world where virtual defeats have weighty consequences, dying in battle meant not only a loss of progress, but also a temporary suspension from reality. Realizing that for a newcomer, such an outcome could turn into a multi-day suspension, Alice decided to intervene. Her decision was not a frivolous one. It came from a deep understanding of the responsibility and possible consequences that every step in this virtual world carries. With such a goal in mind, Alice gathered all her determination and skill to confront the Lord of the Dire Forest, defining her task as saving the newcomer from her inevitable fate. Her drive to act was driven not only by the desire to save the life of another player in this virtual reality, but also by the realization that each rescue strengthens the bond between the participants in this multifaceted world. As the final blow was struck and the mighty Lord of the Dark Forest fell beneath Alice's sword, the dust of battle began to settle, leaving behind only silence and traces of the recent chaos. Alice noticed that her health had decreased again after the bout, but didn't see any trees being cut down. She turned to her inventory, where her gaze fell on items that seemed out of place. These were the belongings of the newcomer that Alice had tried to save, but to her horror and surprise, it seems that she had accidentally taken his life in the course of the fight. To clear things up, Alice ran her eyes over the game logs, looking for confirmation of her hunch. And so, when the name of the dead newcomer flashed before her eyes, she could not believe her eyes. Bahamut, a name worthy of the emperor himself. A chill ran down Alice's spine as she imagined the consequences if a real emperor was actually killed in the game. For a moment, she allowed herself to imagine the absurdity of the situation where she could be executed for such an act in the real world. Alice's laughter cut through the silence, which was partly due to relief at realizing the ridiculousness of the situation, partly due to the stress of recent events. That laugh was a brief moment of respite from the tension and burden of responsibility she felt, for in this virtual world, every action had its consequences and every decision had its price. Alice found solitude on the soft moss, sitting down in the middle of the forest. The leaves rustled around her, and the air was full of the scents of the forest flora, creating an atmosphere of tranquility and isolation from the outside world. She sat, immersed in waiting for Bahamut, the majestic being to whom she intended to return his belongings. In this lost corner of the digital world, 
where time seemed to slow down, Alice pondered the upcoming meeting. As she pondered the future and the past, Alice summoned a wolf cub, a mystical creature that would be her battle buddy when she grew up. This wolf cub that appeared out of nowhere was another testament to the extraordinary possibilities of the virtual world. Gently stroking his fur, she felt a connection to this creature, and a desire was born in her heart to make him not just a companion, but a loyal helper. She began training the wolf cub, teaching him commands and helping him adapt to his future duties. Wolfie, with his quick wit and eagerness to please, was quick to pick up lessons, showing amazing learning abilities. Playing with the wolf cub amidst the whispering of the trees and the light breeze, Alice forgot her worries and expectations for a moment. But suddenly, without heralds, Bahamut appeared in the gap between the trees. His sudden appearance stirred the air, and the atmosphere immediately became tense. The majestic creature whose presence instantly altered the aura of the place was angry, his eyes blazing with discontent due to the recent murder he had experienced. Alice, coming face to face with his power and anger, felt a thrill. She knew the upcoming conversation would be difficult, but she was ready to meet his gaze, armed only with sincerity and a desire to make things right. Alice was sure that the newcomer whose life she had accidentally cut short would wish to return to her for her things. However, the notions she had harbored about a future meeting contrasted sharply with reality when Bahamut approached her. His voice, for all the outward power and grandeur of his appearance, had a surprisingly appealing note that instantly captured her attention. He addressed her so familiarly, calling her by her first name, that Alice felt an unexpected warmth in her heart. It was so unlike her initial expectations. Alice's plan, which had seemed so simple and safe to her, to throw her things at Bahamut and escape his wrath, began to crumble under the weight of his charming voice. Something in his tone, in those sounds, penetrated deep into her mind, causing her to want to not only listen, but to see who was behind those words. Alice's mind hesitated, but an inner voice urged her to stay, to confront her inner fear and face the cocky newcomer. In response to Bahamut's casual address, Alice decided to act mirrored, choosing an equally familial tone for her question. She wondered whether Bahamut himself, that mythical and mysterious character who had already shrouded himself in a halo of mystery in her imagination, was really standing before her. Alice's gaze slid over his figure, assessing every contour and every detail of his appearance. She couldn't deny it. His beauty was stunning and his tall stature added to his majesty and strength. Alice couldn't say she knew Bahamut, for their acquaintance had been too brief and strange, beginning with an accident in the woods. Her heart, however, seemed unwilling to obey reason, fluttering at every move he made, every word that penetrated her ears. It seemed to her that there was an invisible link between them, a thin thread that stretched across the virtual forest, connecting their fates. Alice, under the influence of her sudden feelings, came to a decision that seemed to her to be the only right one for the situation. She decided that Bahamut should become more than just an acquaintance or a friend in this virtual world. Her desire to have him as a lover was so powerful that she didn't even think about the possible consequences of such a choice. When Alice shifted her gaze back to Bahamut, she could barely contain the wave of laughter that came to her lips. She noticed that there was something conspicuously missing from his rookie look, pants, which happened to be in her inventory. The longer she watched Bahamut standing before her in such an amusing and inferior state, the harder it was for her to keep from laughing. The situation seemed more and more absurd, adding to the comical nature of their already uneasy acquaintance. Bahamut, for his part, couldn't help but note that watching his confusion and discomfort without making any attempt to apologize for the murder that had occurred seemed rather cynical on Alice's part. Alice's response, in which she claimed that killing players is just a little thing that happens every day and doesn't deserve much attention, made Bahamut cringe. Her words challenged the accepted norms of their world, where every action mattered and every loss was taken with a certain amount of seriousness. This moment was a turning point in their interaction, showing the difference in their views of the world and the events in it. Alice, for her part, showed a laid-back attitude, which further deepened the intrigue in their unexpected acquaintance, making their future relationship even more unpredictable. Alice was deep in thought, 
she was strategizing how to win the attention of Bahamut, the newcomer with the unexpectedly attractive voice and looks. Her thoughts hovered around the idea of helping him level up, as shared adventures and battles together could be the perfect excuse to bond. Alice realized that a handsome man like Bahamut would undoubtedly attract the attention of the other players, and in particular the girls eager to win his attention. She was determined to act quickly and purposefully. Her mind was already spinning with various plans on how she could best take advantage of the situation to not only help Bahamut grow stronger, but also to discreetly take a special place in his heart. Alice didn't just want to be another companion on his list of gaming acquaintances. She wanted to be someone Bahamut would remember with special trepidation, someone whose name he would associate with adventure and triumph, with warmth and care. She realized that such a goal would require not only a shared interest in gameplay, but also the creation of unique, vivid moments that could be deeply imprinted in his memory. Alice was ready to show Bahamut that she was not only a skillful player, but also an interesting, deep personality, capable of becoming for him not only a partner in battles, but also a trusted comrade with whom he could share his innermost thoughts and experiences. The realization that she had long avoided deep interaction with people was an unexpected blow to Alice. In her world, where she was surrounded by admiration and adoration, it was rare that anything more than mere presence was required. Things were different with Bahamut, however. Her usual methods of influence seemed to be losing their power. Trying to get Bahamut's attention, Alice smiled her most charming smile at him and began to compliment his looks, expecting it to make him admire or at least interested. Her efforts, however, had the opposite effect. Bahamut seemed not only uninspired, but irritated by this treatment. It was a cold shower for Alice, showing that the ways she was used to getting attention weren't working this time. Realizing that her original plan had failed, Alice found herself having to rethink her approach. She needed to find a new way to win Bahamut's attention, a way that would reflect the true depth of her personality, not just outward attractiveness. She decided that she would need to show more sincerity and openness in her interactions with Bahamut, but thought of nothing better than to state that Bahamut had a sexy body. Alice, realizing that her attempt to establish a personal connection by moving on to more personal topics and asking about where Bahamut was from, but the attempt failed, faced a new problem. Bahamut seemed uninterested in the business of talking about the real world, and his attention was entirely focused on getting his stuff back. It was understandable, given his current situation and lack of clothing. Alice pulled his pants out of inventory, but first demanded an answer to her question. Bahamut, on the other hand, finds himself in a tricky position. His reaction, a mixture of irritation and determination, emphasizes the human emotions that permeate through his character's digital facade. Bahamut's response, as he menacingly draws his sword, speaks to the depth of his emotional investment in the situation. This gesture, though performed in a virtual world, clearly demonstrates the tension between the characters, showing how virtual actions can evoke real emotions. As Alice exchanged glances with Bahamut, a smile lit her lips. A spark of mischief flickered in her eyes, realizing that she was facing a creature imbued with impatience and eagerness for immediate action. With a light and playful tone, she emphasized that his frenetic impulse and novice ambition were not enough to defeat her. Bahamut, whose conceit and arrogance knew no bounds, responded with unwavering confidence and a note of disdain in his voice that he was not destined to lose to a woman. Alice, inspired by his challenge, however, astutely observed that Bahamut didn't fully realize that his strength and skill as a knight didn't carry the same weight in the digital world as they did in the real world. Her reflections on how important it was for Bahamut to realize the differences between virtual reality and his familiar world were profound. Alice, feeling a responsibility to enlighten him, tried gently and sympathetically to share her observations— wanting to show him that the rules of the game were different in this new world and that his present methods might not bring the expected results. But Bahamut, whose pride was hurt, did not wish to hear these words. His reply was harsh and uncompromising. With the authority of a majestic creature accustomed to order, he demanded that Alice cease her attempts at instruction. When Bahamut, filled with determination, pointed his sword directly at Alice, the air around them seemed to freeze in anticipation of the confrontation to come. 
Alice, without losing her confidence and inherent calmness, scrutinized his posture and couldn't help but recognize that she was facing an opponent with perhaps the most impressive rack of anyone she had ever encountered in this digital world. Her eyes shone with recognition of Bahamut's skill, and a smile appeared on her face, reflecting not only admiration for his skills, but confidence in her own abilities. Alice realized that despite the external threat Bahamut posed with his sword, her experience and level in the game allowed her to look at this challenge through the lens of being able to demonstrate her own superiority, even without a weapon in hand. Her confidence and calmness in the face of danger were so palpable that even Bahamut, the embodiment of might and power, could not remain indifferent to this display of spirit and skill. Noticing how easily Alice accepted his challenge, Bahamut was confused. His confidence shook for a moment in the face of her resilience and her ability to stand up to him without visible means of defense. He lowered his sword, recognizing that attacking an unarmed woman, even in the context of a game, was not in keeping with his notions of honor and justice. Alice, undaunted by her enthusiasm and desire to prove her superiority, continued to challenge Bahamut, this time offering to test herself in unarmed combat. With confidence, as if she were recounting a walk in the park, Alice stated that she had once managed to catch a bear using only her hands, as if it was not a feat but just another everyday experience. Her words filled with ease and confidence sounded to Bahamut like a challenge he couldn't ignore. At the moment when Bahamut, impulsive and irritated, decided to attack, Alice, with elegance and agility worthy of the best martial artists, made a pirouette, dodging his attack. Her movements were so graceful and precise that it seemed as if she were dancing rather than fighting. Bahamut, in spite of his strength and skill, was unable to match her speed and grace, which only increased his annoyance. Alice, on the other hand, saw it more as a game than a serious battle. Her laughter and the smile that accompanied her every movement emphasized the stark contrast between her ease of being and Bahamut's growing anger. At the climax of the bout, Alice, as if in jest, gave Bahamut a flick that was powerful enough to drain nearly all of his health points, confirming her exceptional skill and strength even in such an unusual action for combat. In the end, Bahamut, having lost his last strength, fell dead like a monument to his underestimated opponent. This victory for Alice was not just a triumph in virtual combat, but an indication of how self-confidence, a combination of strength and agility, and the ability to find joy in even the most tense moments can turn into an unexpected outcome in a battle where logic and calculation give way to art and skill. As the world enveloped them in its mysterious events, Alice, shrouded in an aura of innocent naivete, could not refrain from an embarrassed laugh. Her intentions were far from wanting to cause lethality to her rival, the great Bahamut, whose body now rested ingenuous on the ground. Sitting down next to his lifeless form, she joked merrily about the fate of his pants, as if they were the protagonists of this play. Alice playfully speculated on how those pants might disappear into oblivion if she simply put them out of her inventory, preferring to keep them for herself as a trophy of their unusual encounter. She even shared how Bahamut could relate to her, adding jokingly that if he didn't want his port key, he might well ignore a girl who was stronger than him in battle. Those words, flowing easily and effortlessly from Alice's lips, stirred Bahamut's emotions. He was seized with irritation, for his current state, labeled dead, made it impossible for him to react. It was ironic that a powerful knight, who had fought numerous enemies and always came out victorious, was now unable to respond to the young maiden's impertinent but playful remarks. Alice, for all her belligerent might, appeared to him not just as a victor, but as a messenger of a new way of looking at familiar things, including the meaning of victory and defeat, and the value of things we consider important, like the pair of pants that were the subject of their unusual dispute. At that moment, Alice, who easily intertwined seriousness and banter, suggested that if Bahamut had addressed her with courtesy, she would not have hesitated to give him back his pants. With a light laugh celebrating this unusual episodic victory, Alice used her virtual powers to send Bahamut's body back to the game's revival point, continuing to reflect on what was happening with a slight degree of self-irony. 
She wondered if she had gone too far in her jokes and actions, after all. Just before the battle, she had even waited for him for an hour just to return his pants that belonged to him. However, in the back of her mind, Alice felt a shadow of sadness, realizing that this was the second time she had defeated Bahamut, and that fact could have unintended consequences. Her heart filled with anxiety at the thought that Bahamut, frustrated with the game because of her actions, might end up refusing to participate further in this virtual world. Alice realized that every action she took, even the most innocuous or done in jest, carried consequences that could unpredictably affect her relationships with other players and their perceptions of the gameplay. Thus, behind Alice's light jokes and playful actions, there was a deep thoughtfulness and realization that the virtual world, with all its adventures and challenges, is closely intertwined with the real emotions and feelings of the players, behind which are living people with their vulnerabilities and hopes. In the silence of her retreat, Alice was deep in thought. She pondered the difficult task before her, how to win Bahamut's heart after all these events. Seeking an answer, and perhaps hoping to find a new path for her actions, she called for a geographic assistant. This assistant, a creature created by the virtual world to help players, seemed unusually cute to her. With his appearance around Alice, the heaviness of her musings dissipated for a moment, and she could not help but marvel at his presence, forgetting for the moment her cares. However, returning to the original purpose of summoning the aid, Alice asked him a question that had long occupied her thoughts. She asked about the location of two important places in their world, Deaver's Library and Alpha's Library. This knowledge could be the key to new discoveries, or even help in her quest to find the way to Bahamut's heart. The geographical assistant, who had been patiently waiting for the question, perked up at the sound of it and provided Alice with a comprehensive answer. He explained that the nearest library requested was four hours away by special transportation and detailed the route it was to take. Having gotten the information she needed, Alice gratefully withdrew her assistant, once again left alone with her thoughts and plans for the future. Alice was faced with a dilemma. The journey to the library in the virtual world seemed long and laborious. After weighing the pros and cons, she concluded that going to a real-world library would prove to be a much more rational decision. Thoughts of how Bahamut would cope in the game without his pants flashed through her mind, but she consoled herself with the thought of returning to the virtual world soon to do him justice and give him back his lost clothes. With that decision, Alice left the digital world behind, disconnected from the game, and found herself back in the familiar surroundings of her home, on her couch. At that moment, Anes came up to her, whom Alice had at once told to prepare a dress for going out. Anes did not hide her delight at the thought of her mistress finally deciding to leave her seclusion. For Anes, it was a sign of change, a foreshadowing that Alice was about to meet the world outside her home again, which was undoubtedly a joyous and meaningful event. While Annes was glad that Alice could make it in time for the rest of the concubines that were in the garden, Alice just stared at the maid in silence. Annes, with skillful and quick movements, dressed Alice in a dress she felt was perfect for the upcoming event. This dress not only emphasized the advantages of Alice's figure, but was also intended to impress the emperor and everyone in the garden. But for Alice, who was accustomed to a more private and modest way of life, the outfit seemed too provocative. The neckline on her chest and the abundance of jewelry made her feel uncomfortable and bewildered. She couldn't understand why it was necessary to resort to such methods to gain respect and attention. Inez, for her part, tried to convey to Alice the importance of these measures. In a world where the power and protection of the emperor could be decisive factors in well-being, appearance and the ability to impress were not the least important. Aness is convinced that to earn the Emperor's favor and secure a favorable future for herself, Alice needs to step out of her comfort zone and embrace playing by the rules set by the court. Alice turned to her faithful maid, Aness, with a question that seemed to her of little importance, yet exciting at the same time. She wondered if Annis would accompany her to the garden, that corner of tranquility and beauty where every flower and every path held stories of the past but the maid's answer was not what Alice had hoped for. Annes, with an apologetic look, explained that Mrs. Pharaohs, a high-ranking person in their world, had expressed a desire to have only concubines with her today, so Annes would not be able to keep Alice company on her walk through the garden. 
Alice, despite her momentary disappointment, could not help smiling, for deep down she saw in this refusal a hidden opportunity. Aness's absence meant freedom for Alice, a chance to break the routine of the day and go to the library instead of the garden, a place of peace and reflection. Aness recounted an event from the past that had left an indelible mark on the history of their home, and now it seemed as if the echoes of those days still echoed in every corner of their abode. One servant girl, a modest girl who, until that moment, had only been a shadow of her mistress, suddenly found herself the center of attention of the emperor himself. Accompanying her mistress, she not only attracted the emperor's attention and became his concubine. This event was not just a romantic story. It was filled with secret meanings, power, and a desire to change the established order of things. Mrs. Fairrose, inspired by these events, but at the same time fearing their consequences, decided to proceed with the utmost caution. She was anxious to avoid a repetition of a situation in which external circumstances might have changed the life of her house in the same unexpected way. The reflection in the mirror showed Alice in an elegant dress, but she couldn't convince herself that it really brought out her beauty. Not finding the spark she was looking for in her reflection, Alice was plunged into doubt. Anes, standing beside her as if reading her thoughts, hastened to assure her that the elegance and nobility of her outfit would certainly impress the Empress. Those words, spoken with such confidence, should have been inspiring, but Alice remained skeptical, only faintly believing it was possible to win the heart of such a majestic person. Saying goodbye to Anes was warm and heartfelt, like a final chord before starting a new chapter in her life. Leaving the maid in the cozy room, Alice headed for the exit, where the bright sun awaited her, illuminating the streets with its brilliant light. The air was soaked with warmth and freshness, and the sun's rays played on the surface of everything they touched, creating a sense of celebration and joy. After walking for a while, Alice couldn't help but recognize that it was indeed a beautiful day. It seemed as if nature itself had decided to bless the emperor's upcoming walk in the garden, providing the perfect conditions for such an event. In the back of her mind, however, Alice was relieved that she had chosen not to participate. Her choice to go to the library, seeking solitude with books and knowledge, seemed far more appealing to her than the opportunity to spend time in the company of dignitaries. This decision was not just an escape from court intrigue or idleness, but a step to meet her own interests and thirst for knowledge, which made her way to the library not just a walk, but a journey into a world where each book could be a window to a new, unexplored world. Alice's gaze, filled with longing for freedom, glided over the majestic castle gates that symbolized the boundary between the world of court intrigue and the promise of adventure beyond. She realized that every step beyond these walls required not only courage, but also the approval of the emperor himself, whose word was law in these lands. Standing there, absorbed in thoughts of the possibility of exploring the world outside the castle, Alice suddenly felt something break the silence of the familiar morning. Turning around to find the source of the unexpected sound, her gaze was suddenly drawn to a tree adorning the castle garden. And there, on one of the high branches, sat an aristocrat whose presence in such an unusual place was a real mystery. His face lit up with joy at his unexpected encounter with Alice, as if he had found something wonderful in this chance moment. Alice, for her part, remained motionless, taken by surprise by this strange scene. Her surprise that someone from the aristocracy preferred the solitude of a tree branch to the mundane activities of the court was mixed with curiosity. Alice, faced with an unusual encounter, couldn't take her eyes off the strange aristocrat whose appearance stood out even among the upper class. His robe, made of the finest fabrics and silk shirt, clearly indicated his high origin. Red locks of hair playing in the sun and an exquisite sword that seemed not only a weapon but a work of art added a special charm to his image. Alice, feeling the need for etiquette in front of such a noble, bowed gracefully, introducing herself without any further words. The aristocrat jumped down from the tree with ease and grace, his movements full of confidence and grace. He was clearly surprised, but at the same time pleasantly amused that Alice didn't utter a word of apology for not recognizing him immediately. His interest in Alice was only heightened by this singularity. He appreciated how she, despite the obvious difference in their social status, 
was able to maintain a calm and dignified demeanor that made their meeting even more memorable. The presence of a sword on an aristocrat said that he had not only a high position, but also permission from the emperor to bear arms, a privilege available only to the chosen few. This emphasized his special place not only in the hierarchy of the court, but also at the very heart of the empire's political power. Alice realized that such a meeting could turn out to be either a blessing or a disaster, depending on how their future relationship would turn out. What stood before Alice was not just an aristocrat, but a man whose identity could upend the court's view of opportunity and politics. Winter Cruella Bahamut, as he introduced himself, was none other than the emperor's own younger brother. The discovery made Alice's heart beat even harder. After all, the man standing before her possessed not only nobility and refinement, but could also influence the fates of people in the empire by having direct access to the most powerful man in the state. The fact that Winter, being so close to the emperor, had chosen to introduce himself to her, and not as a mere passerby, but by revealing his true identity, made Alice think about a lot of things. She had to balance the desire to make a good impression with the need to remain cautious, because any action or word she spoke could be interpreted in many different ways. She realized that fortune seemed to have turned away from her, for such an encounter could have had unpredictable consequences. In an attempt to avoid further scrutiny, Alice decided to bow out dutifully, hoping that this gesture would allow her to avoid unnecessary questions and perhaps even preserve her anonymity. But Winter, unexpectedly, addressed her with a question that made her inwardly freeze. A meeting with such a dignitary made a difference. The question about her direction made Alice think for a moment. She was well aware that the library and the garden were at completely different ends of the palace, and any attempt to assure Winter that her path was to the emperor in the garden would look unconvincing and even foolish. Winter seemed to read her doubts and confusion with ease, indicating that the garden was in the wrong direction. The moment was a real test for Alice. Her inner state was full of confusion and indecision, for she was caught off guard by such a display of insight from the emperor's younger brother, and she simply stated that she would take a walk before going to the garden. In response to Alice's awkward statement about wanting to go for a walk, Winter suddenly became interested in her plans. His face lit up with a smile as he asked a question filled with genuine curiosity and perhaps a slight sneer. Did Alice actually want to see the emperor's face, implying that her motives may have been more personal and related to a desire for male attention? This suggestion of Winter's that Alice might have been looking for a way to draw attention to herself in high places made her inwardly flare up with indignation. However, the realization that it was none other than the emperor's own brother standing before her made Alice restrain her emotions. Instead of expressing her protest or annoyance, she chose a mask of politeness and smiled back as Winter continued to smile naively, unaware of Alice's inner struggle and how his words touched her pride and feelings. There was a moment of tension in the room where every object was inscribed with stories of the past. When Winter, with an aristocratic poise and a coldness that seemed to presage a storm, slowly extended his hand toward Alice's face. She, like a nimble cat, skillfully avoided his touch, recoiling with dignity and a secret distaste in her eyes. Her reaction was not mere refusal, but defiance, rebellion against his words laced with venomous contempt. Winter, with a voice filled with icy calmness, condemned Alice, calling her an unwanted concubine who dared to resist his desire to touch her hair, as if he, the emperor's brother, had the right to any wish. Alice, for her part, inwardly rebelled against this injustice, pondering what a creep Winter was for using his status for such lowly acts. She felt not just anger brewing inside her, but a spark of resistance, a desire to defend her dignity and independence. Suppressing her trepidation and fear, Alice gathered the mana in her hands, ready to break the ban placed on the emperor's concubines, the ban on the possession and use of magic. The emperor's concubines are forbidden to use magic because it could jeopardize the emperor's safety, and if her magic is found out, Alice could be executed. As the tension in the air became almost palpable, time seemed to stand still in the room. Winter suddenly changed his tone, as if the wind of change had brought freshness to the stifling atmosphere. 
This interruption of the moment of conflict was sudden, like a ray of sunshine breaking through the clouds after a long storm. Winter, putting aside his threats and contempt, suddenly showed interest in the dialogue, eager to hear what Alice would say to his question. The moment Winter made his assumptions about Alice's intentions, his words sounded like a challenge, as if he were deliberately trying to stir up a storm of emotion in her, claiming that her supposed willingness to leave the estate before the garden visit showed her indifference to the emperor, he also did not miss the opportunity to accuse Alice of being unwilling to change her fate, predicting a life of imprisonment behind the emperor's walls as, in his words, a weakling. The words hit Alice like an icy wind, sending her into a surge of anger and determination. Something inside her flared, a desire to prove Winter wrong and defend her honor. In her imagination, she had already pictured grabbing him by the pecs, as if trying to physically feel her ability to fight back against his challenge, and hurling words of outrage at him, berating him for all the negativity he had brought into her life. Alice realized that every word Winter said, every remark he made, were not just words. They were a challenge to her own identity, her will and strength. It was a moment when Alice didn't just want to shut him up, but to prove that she was much more than just a concubine in the imperial chambers, that she had the indomitable strength and determination in her heart to fight for her place in the world and to change her destiny. But in that challenge lurked a hidden power, a power that drove Alice not just to defend herself, but to rethink her goals, her future, and what she was willing to do to change it. After a stormy exchange with Winter, Alice found the strength to pull herself together and return to the common courtesy characteristic of palace etiquette. With a dignity and composure that was beyond her, she performed a curtsy, a graceful movement full of respect and humility, and turned to leave. Winter, however, was in no hurry to let her go without an answer to his question, once more trying to get into her plans, asking her intentions. Alice, feeling the gravity of the moment, replied that her path lay to the library, a place of knowledge and solitude. She asked Winter if she had permission to leave, expecting some sign or word from him that would authorize her to continue on her way. Her answer was silence, drawn out and impenetrable, which Alice interpreted as agreement, sighing inwardly with relief and gathering her strength to leave. However, when she was on the verge of leaving, Winter broke the silence with an unexpected suggestion that sounded almost like temptation, an offer to escape from the castle. Those words stopped Alice in her tracks, forcing her to turn around. The suggestion challenged everything she was used to and opened the door to uncharted possibilities. Facing the choice, Alice felt the weight of Winter's every word settle on her shoulders. Escape from the castle? The idea seemed maddening, but at the same time, enticing. The suggestion opened a new path before her, a path to freedom and perhaps a new life she could only imagine. At that moment, Alice was faced with a choice that could change everything. When Winter promised Alice to share the secret of the loophole, interest flared in Alice's heart, despite her inner skepticism and reticence. She couldn't deny that the thought of a possible path to freedom aroused her curiosity. Winter, as if enjoying the moment of tense anticipation, paused dramatically before continuing. Then, unexpectedly for Alice, he moved on to personalities, noting her attractive figure, which momentarily embarrassed her and made her feel uncomfortable. She instinctively covered herself, trying to shield herself from his gaze. But Winter's next words took Alice even more by surprise. He said she could leave the castle and be free on one condition if she agreed to be his concubine. The suggestion sounded absurd to her, striking her as insolent and unexpected. Alice felt a surge of emotions, a mixture of shock, outrage, and disbelief at his words. Such a solution to her dilemma seemed pure madness to her, and she couldn't believe that Winter was seriously considering such a plan as a possibility. This moment was a test for Alice, forcing her to look at Winter from a completely different angle, realizing the depth of his audacity and possible willingness to overstep any boundaries to get what she wanted. Her reaction to his proposal was a test not only of her morals, but also of her will to freedom, putting before her a choice between her own honor and her thirst for freedom that involved no easy answers. Alice felt a chill of horror run down her spine 
as Winter spoke so confidently and easily of the possibility of making her his concubine, as if it were the most common thing in the world. His words that the emperor had not yet decided to play her fate sounded to Alice like a sentence opening the door to a completely unacceptable future. The fact that such situations had already occurred only added gravity to her sudden realization of how complicated and confusing fates could be within the walls of the imperial court. Jumping away from winter, Alice felt trapped by his words, which seemed like poison. Her horror increased when he tried to reassure her by talking about the happiness of his concubines. These words sounded in her ears like a mockery, because for Alice, freedom and the opportunity to decide her own fate were much more valuable than any promise of happiness under someone else's control. Winter's assertion that she was his type only made her more disgusted and more eager to assert her dignity and independence, even if it meant standing up to all the power and authority the emperor's brother possessed. She realized that Winter's words and promises were only the tip of the iceberg in the games of power and intrigue that reigned in the imperial court. The resolve in her heart only grew stronger. To find a way to escape the fate of a concubine and prove that she was not someone else's property, but a free person capable of deciding for herself how to live her life. Alice looked at Winter with a mixture of anger, disgust, and bewilderment. Her words denouncing his suggestion as an unacceptable joke had no effect. Winter stood before her, and his words declaring the seriousness of his intentions sounded like a sentence in her ears. He was so sure of his words that for a moment Alice felt trapped in his crazed gaze. Winter's words that the only thing that could stop him was death made Alice feel cold inside. She realized she was in front of a man whose madness and obsession could go to any extreme. The thought flashed through her mind that Winter really did call himself no less than an emperor, believing he had the right to control people's fates as he saw fit. Winter presented Alice with information that fundamentally altered perceptions of the personal life of the Lord of the Empire himself. With a seriousness that left no room for doubt, he dispelled the widespread rumors about the Emperor's harem, claiming that in his heart there was truly room for only one woman, his lawful wife, whom he loved infinitely. The idea of concubines, as it turned out, was nothing more than a facade created under pressure from vassals seeking to strengthen their position at court through personal ties to the emperor. Alice, not hiding her surprise, objected, pointing to the presence of the emperor's famous favorites at the same gathering where they were. Winter, however, explained with unwavering certainty that the women Alice had alluded to were in fact the very concubines he said Winter had taken for himself from the emperor. However, while emphasizing the seriousness of the moment, Winter did not forget to warn Alice of the potential consequences if the information reached the wrong ears. He made it clear that exposure of the secret could have the most disastrous consequences for Alice, up to and including a death sentence on the scaffold. This warning, hanging in the air like the invisible sword of Damocles, was a reminder that in a world of political games and palace intrigue, knowledge is power, but with power comes great responsibility and sometimes deadly danger. In the same conspiratorial conversation that continued to unfold in the shadows of the palace halls, Winter brought in another detail that made Alice think deeply. He made it clear that Emperor Bahamut IV, whose name has long been synonymous with cruelty and unrelenting power in the eyes of many, is unlikely to perform a wedding ceremony with Alice without a good, highly significant reason. The statement further emphasized the difficult position she found herself in, finding herself part of a grand political game in which the stakes were incredibly high. As she pondered Winter's words, Alice couldn't help but think of Schnarl's motives for sending her to the emperor. In the kingdom of Schnarl, where Alice had been born and raised, Bahamut IV was considered a tyrant whose reputation and power inspired fear even beyond his own domain. In an effort to protect their country from a possible invasion, Schnarella decided to use Alice as a chess piece in this dangerous game, hoping that if she bore an heir to the emperor, it could somehow ensure their nation's protection and peaceful coexistence under the wing of his omnipotence. However, despite the high stakes and great expectations placed on her shoulders, fate had it differently. 
In seven long years spent in a golden cage, waiting for her role in this political intrigue, Alice never had the honor of meeting the emperor himself. During their mysterious dialogue filled with political intrigue and hidden agendas, Winter suddenly made a remark that caught Alice off guard. He pointed out her nonchalant expression throughout the conversation, despite the fact that he was clearly eager to lend her support and had even taken steps to keep her out of possible trouble by sending her away from palace intrigue. In concluding his address to Alice by urging her to expect favorable news, Winter might have hoped for her gratitude or understanding. His words, however, elicited quite the opposite reaction. Alice, whose patience was already at its limit after all she had been through, could not hide her indignation. Emotions came over her in a wave, and unable to hold back any longer, she left him irritably, leaving Winter standing alone. Her footsteps echoed across the terrain, and the only thought in her mind was that if their paths crossed again, she could hardly refrain from expressing her displeasure in a more tangible way. A sudden insight swept over Alice as if a bolt of lightning had pierced her consciousness, awakening in her not only determination but clarity of thought. She, standing in the open air, felt a chill begin to waft around her. At that moment, her gaze involuntarily slid toward Winter, whose presence evoked in her ambiguous feelings ranging from irritation to rivalry. Alice, focused as never before, gathered mana in her palms, the very substance of life and magic that pulsed around her, filling the air with a thrill of anticipation. Turning to the ancient and powerful wind goddess Sylphidel, Alice became an intermediary between the earthly world and the unseen forces of nature. Her voice, though inaudible to those around her, rose in prayer, invoking the favor of the goddess. The magic began to work. The wind, at first barely perceptible, gradually gained strength and began to swirl around, making the fabric of her dress flutter playfully and dance to the rhythm of the natural element. In this whirlwind, like an artist using a brush, the wind gathered a pile of dirt from the ground, which, obeying the unknown laws of magic, acquired its own flight path. Time seemed to slow its run as the dirt, captured by the whirlwind, flew straight at winter. This moment was the climax of a little drama played out in the open air, where the elements, summoned by Alice, decided to give a lesson to whoever she thought deserved immediate retribution. As soon as the whirlwind generated by Alice accomplished its mission, the dirt hit Winter's face with furious precision, leaving him utterly bewildered at what had happened. Winter stood there, stunned, and unable to comprehend how exactly he had managed to be the target of such an unusual greeting. Meanwhile, Alice, barely restraining the waves of laughter that came to her lips, allowed herself only to whistle softly, as if to emphasize her carelessness and lightness of heart after the deed she had done. As she moved away from the scene, she didn't turn around to check on Winter's handling of the unexpected gift he'd just received. Alice, absorbed in her own thoughts and in the satisfaction of a successfully realized plan, continued on her way. There was no room in her heart for regret over Winter's possible offense, but in the back of her mind, she felt some disappointment at not having a mentor in the art of magic. The thought of not having a teacher to guide and develop her magical abilities made Alice feel alone along the way. She realized that the path of self-taught in the world of magic is a path full of thorns and trials, where every step forward requires tremendous effort and dedication. Alice deeply regretted having to walk this difficult path alone, without the guidance and support of a wise mentor who could have been her light in a world where magic was not just an art, but a dangerous weapon that required responsibility and understanding. Immersed in the world of ancient manuscripts and dusty tomes, Alice learned the basics of magic, slowly making her way up the path of knowledge. She had to limit herself to the most basic of spells, for the complexity and depth of true mastery were beyond the scope of her self-training. However, among her many attempts and experiments, Alice managed to discover and develop one particular skill that set her apart from other aspiring mages. It was an invocation of the wind goddess Sylphidel, a skill Alice considered her ace up her sleeve. This spell wasn't a simple trick or a handy tool for light household needs. No, it was a real power capable of summoning the wind, controlling it, creating gusts and whirlwinds out of it that could serve not only for flirting with the elements, but as a powerful weapon in a fight. 
This skill was for her a kind of magical manifestation of her inner world, where wind symbolized freedom, changeability, and unpredictability. Turning to the wind goddess was not only a demonstration of her unique magical talent, but also a reflection of her desire for independence and her desire to follow her own path in the world of magic.